Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to our next race in the United States class. Uh, we are privileged this evening to have two amazing women to take us through tonight's conversation, race and reproduction, from slavery and genocide to designer babies. Uh, I am actually just going to say the names of these incredible women, and they're going to own and uh, say their own introductions because their introduction, they have been involved in so many different things. You've actually had the pleasure of uh, having Chanel Matthews here before our activists in residence here at the New School. And uh, we are absolutely honored to have Professor Chuzacha, excuse me, Sujatha Jesudasan, who is one of our newest faculty at Milano. We are so incredibly excited that uh, she accepted the offer. So let me turn it over to Sujatha and to Chanel uh, so that we can hear tonight's lecture. Ladies. Thank you very much, Michelle. And um, welcome all to this, uh, what we hope is uh, uh, two conversations. So um, Chanel and I are gonna spend some time interviewing each other around um, our experiences and why we care about this set of issues and what we know about it. And then we're gonna open it up um, for as much as possible for Q&A. And um, just to start out uh, with a little introduction about myself, um, I have done, I've worked in social justice movements for the last 25 years, um, starting out with doing community organizing in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, um, to working with women on welfare, to immigrant rights organizing, domestic violence prevention organizing, and then most recently working on issues of reproductive health rights and justice. And um, I've held a variety of roles, and as I talk about these issues, you'll hear the different aspects of my career um, coming out. But I'm also super thrilled to be here, uh, both at the New School and in this conversation, with a very dear friend, Chanel. So um, with that, I'm going to pass it to you for your introduction. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Chanel Matthews. I am your inaugural activist in residence here at the New School, and incredibly proud to be joining Sujatha tonight to talk about uh, reproductive health rights and justice. Um, during my time here at the New School, I'm doing four things. Research on how to um, significantly reduce anti-black racism through the media. Writing for a public seminar. Uh, my first piece went up last week or the week before on anti-blackness and curiosity. Um, I would love to have a conversation with any students or faculty who are interested in talking about that. Um, doing public programming. So last Monday, I hosted a panel on black women, electoral justice and the future of American democracy with um, Tashara Jones from St. Louis, Jessica Bird from Three Point Strategies, and Charlene Carruthers, and Diva Woodley, professor here of politics. And um, then doing a little bit of training. So some work on communications with students and faculty. Um, my background is in strategic communications, largely. I've been working in public interest comms for the last 10 years. Before joining uh, Black Lives Matter, where I now serve as Director of Communications, I was working with the Sierra Club on their Beyond Coal campaign and the ACLU on welfare reform and LGBTQ rights. Right, thank you, Cheryl. And um, I failed to mention that uh, two classes that I'll be teaching next semester, one is called Speaking Race to Power, um, and it is gonna be a class on the practice of dealing with issues of race, power, and privilege in our projects and workspaces and among friends and allies. And then the second class I'll be teaching is a class called Reimagining Social Movements, and that is a class bringing social movements in conversation with design and innovation. So uh, those are the two classes. Um, and um, just to start out, um, one of the things that happens often in the conversation about reproduction, reproductive health or rights is often it's seen as a very siloed conversation. So either people think that this is only about abortion and contraception, and truly most people don't think about those issues until um, they need them. And so there's a way in which these set of issues are, tend to be very siloed and marginalized. And so we wanted to start out with just a little activity or exercise where uh, people are gonna turn to somebody they're sitting next to. And just in five minutes, you're gonna share with each other what is something that is current in your sexual or reproductive life that you're either pleased or proud of or that is challenging to you. It's a five minute conversation. Only share what you feel comfortable sharing. 
I get stuck with my jeans. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Only share what you feel comfortable sharing. And um, I, I, we will time it and we'll um, bring you all back. So just turn to somebody sitting next to you. Something current, not in the past, something current that's happening in your sexual and or reproductive life.
All right, folks. Um, clearly a juicy and interesting question. <laughs> um, so now that people had a chance to just chat about their sexual and reproductive lives, I'm curious what kinds of questions came up that you would like us to answer during our talk today. <laughs> so, um, so we were talking about the tic tac um, and like the ways that I don't know. She might need to. I'll find one. Oh, oh, here you can take that one. And you can take that. Thank you. Uh, so we were talking about the pink. Oh, this is that mic. Uh, the pink tax and the ways in which it like creeps up into your life in all kinds of ways, specifically around like period products, but also in like lots of other things that you wouldn't think about. And the fact that so often economists and other men folks don't know that it even exists or why it exists and that it continues to be a thing. Great, great question. Yes, uh, thank you for that. It was an interesting exchange. Um, as a male, um, my thought process is how um, being the, the half of a heterosexual relationship, how do I um, help sort of um, educate myself not to trip into something that would necessarily be negative as it relates to reproductive rights for someone I'm involved with? Um, and just how a, a male in general can help with this conversation. Right. Um, as you can tell, I'm older, and I would like you to talk a little bit about sexuality and aging, especially post-menopausal issues that nobody talks about and nobody works on and nobody told you there were going to be changes. And I'm angry. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we'll take one last question. Oh, oh wow. Um, so my question is very overarching. Um, where do you see reproduction and the status of access to reproductive rights, et cetera, in this Trump administration? It's a, I know it's a very large question, but just sharing your thoughts on where you see like policy going, um, just access to information, access to products, and for people across the country of different like race, sex, gender, etc. Great, thank you. So, um, well, yeah, we're done with the questions. We'll take the the mic back. Thank you. Um, so. As you can see, um, when we start talking about and connecting these issues to our each of our own personal lives, the whole issue becomes both m bigger and more interesting and more integrated. So um, as soon as we start talking about the ways in which it connects to ourselves, both today and in the past and in the future, we start actually having more interesting questions. And so both Chanel and Chanel's going to interview me. I'm going to interview her. Um, hopefully we'll get to some of these questions and then we'll also come back to them. So with that, I'm going to start out and ask Sujatha, um, why do you care about this work and how does it connect to your purpose in the world? Broad, but good. Yeah. Um, so I started caring about reproductive health rights and justice um, early on in my activism for two reasons. The first was I became very aware that as a woman, the two dominant ways in which women are kept in their place in society, one is through violence, right? So women are beaten when we step out of line, when we don't perform in normative ways. But the second is the attempt to control our bodies through controlling our reproduction. So if women can't have autonomy and self-determination about the most fundamental aspect of being a human being, which is bodily autonomy, then we have no right to full citizenship, small c citizenship, um, and participation in society. 
And so that was my first entry into why I cared about these issues of, so if society is attempting to control me, either through violence or through controlling my access to information, to uh, services, to healthcare, to, and most importantly, to decision making about my body, that was the first uh, part. But secondly, and this was the part that um, was in some ways like even more horrifying uh, to me was as somebody who cares about justice, sort of the core of oppression is the division between people who are considered human beings and people who are considered others, right? It's the dehumanization of other people, whether it is around race, whether it's class, whether it's around sexuality, all of those things. And at the very heart of that othering is love and sex and family. And so if we deny people the ability to love who they wanna love, have the kind of sex that they want to have, to build the families that they want to build, that is the kernel of all oppressions. And so for me, the fundamental sort of vector of social oppression in all of its forms is around denying people's humanity around love, sex, and family. And that is really what reproductive health and rights and justice is about. And so um, it transformed the way I started thinking about this issue, not as you know, this is a women's plumbing issue, which is how most people tend to think about it, or this is an abortion rights issue, but this is actually a fundamental issue of justice for all communities, which is why you see people in either current and past administrations so deeply invested in controlling women's reproductive rights and access, it's because this is how they control communities. So there's a eugenics and a population control aspect to this, um, and it is about fundamental othering. So you mentioned reproductive health rights and justice, and oftentimes the justice portion of that um, is left out. We talk about people's rights, so how we pass legislation to give people access to reproductive health care, or physiologically, what's happening in somebody's body that allows them to become pregnant or not become pregnant, or some other, um, other way of talking about it. But if you could talk a little bit about why this is a justice issue, for whom and why. Yeah, so the more, more traditional understanding, um, and I was part of the reproductive justice movement as we started making the distinction between reproductive health, which is really about services, and it's a public health approach, uh, which often tends to be a prevention approach, right? Preventing teenage pregnancy, preventing STDs, et cetera. Um, so there's the reproductive health approach. There's the reproductive rights, which is about the, really sort of the legal right um, which says nothing about access, but it's really premised on individual autonomy and individual rights, and does not account for then community and collective and the justice. And so the reproductive justice piece of it both is an understanding that we have multiple identities, um, and that it's not just the right to prevent pregnancy, or prevent STDs, but it is a proactive and affirmative right to have the love, sex, and families that we want. Um, and so for anybody in this room who's ever wanted a family, who's ever wanted to have sex, or who's ever wanted to love somebody, this movement is about that. And so, you know, going back to this question about like, what is men's role in this? Well, if men are interested in love, sex, and family, then this is, the issue for them too, um, in all of its forms, right? So it's not just that women are interested in this, but we all are. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got involved in this movement? No, um, yeah. Um, so I used to do violence prevention work, domestic violence, worked with men around uh, batter intervention work. And when I started understanding this fundamental issue around how it's at the heart of all oppressive systems um, is also when I started learning about the reproductive justice movement um, and the conversations that black women were having around this, um, the work of Dorothy Roberts, which was transformative. If folks have not yet read the assigned readings, please do, it will change your life and how you think about these issues. Um, but there were some just amazing thinkers and writers at the time who, reconceptualize this issue from an individual right to healthcare and an individual legal right um, to much more about people's lived experiences in the multiplicity 
and the complex ways in which we think and talk and act around it. Um, then I, and I just like this question that we started out with, I always love because every day of our lives, we're thinking about something related to love, sex, and family, but we don't think that that's actually about reproductive rights or justice. What keeps you engaged? I mean, it, times are hard now in particular, but times have almost always been hard for people seeking to access these fundamental rights. What keeps you here? An enormous amount of rage. <laughs> Just like absolute towering, towering rage. Um, and really is, it's about my fundamental humanity that some group of mostly white men somewhere are deciding where my rights as a human being stop. Um, and that, like, and as far as they're concerned, it's stopping somewhere deep inside my body that they get to decide about. Um, and when I think about this as the, if we could really reframe this movement as a movement about love, sex, and family, I think it would transform the ways in which we fight on this issue, right? So instead of talking about access to abortion, who, like, nobody, wakes up every morning thinking, oh, this is the right I want to fight with for, right? Like it tends to be further down on the list. But if I think about every morning I wake up and think like, okay, who is it that I love? And I have a partner who is undocumented. That's about this movement. You know, I think about my mother who didn't get the right to decide whether or not she wanted to have children because she was of a generation where all women got married and all women had children. Like those are the kinds of things that I think about, or just the you know the notion of like you know how do we have like how do we maintain loving sexual relationships across borders? Another way. So like when I think about it in the daily, like all the daily ways it touches my life, that's what keeps me engaged. This movement, both externally and internally, can be really challenging. Um, tell me how it's healed you, or how it's broken your heart. Now, I'll start with the heartbreak. <laughs> um, I'd say the biggest heartbreak has been the ways in which um, men don't participate in this. Like somehow that this, you know, as a heterosexual woman, I have sex with men, I love men, and that somehow they, like there's some line that they think they are not either authorized to cross around this or that they don't take the ownership, um, that somehow love and sex and family are just their purview of women. Um, yeah, because it just seems like if we are partners in life, then this is like our partnership in life is about these things. And so that has been the biggest heartbreak um, for me. And then just in terms of healing, um, I, I think about one of the things that I've loved about James Baldwin um, and his writing is just his absolute clarity, like the ways he's able to sort of like, you know, remove the muck and see clearly. Um, when I think about this issue in terms of just how fundamentally at the heart of oppressive issues it is, right? So like you think about genocide of Native American people and it was about destroying families and communities and taking children away. Slavery was fundamentally about controlling reproduction. Immigration, um, and all even today's conversation or debate or fight over abortion is really about how many white babies are gonna be born in the United States and how do we keep that number up, right? So even though it might be poor women and women of color disproportionately impacted, the vast majority of women who are getting pregnant who want abortions are white women. And so this is about keeping that population growing. So there's just something about like having that clarity um, that helps me stay an integrated whole person of like just not being crazed by the misinformation around it. And so like there's something deeply healing for me about being able to sort of see and hold on to the truth of this matter. Before we talk about what you would do if you were queen for a day, um, I'm curious, um, because I value your opinion and because you work at the intersection of innovation and reproductive health rights and justice, 
we are in a, a state of workarounds at this point. I'm not sure um, if any of us are going to be able to pass successful legislation under a Trump administration um, that betters options for people seeking reproductive health rights and justice care. What are we What are we doing? What do we do? Well, I think the immediate strategy is just obstructionist. Um, and I mean obstructionist in the sense of just pouring sand in the gears, mm. right? Right now, um, we are just too fucking polite. Like, as movement leaders and activists, we are still playing by the rules. And what it would take for us to break those rules and say, I don't care if you want to talk to me tomorrow. I don't care if you let me into your legislative office tomorrow, but this is where we actually draw the line because it is our politeness and our going alongness that is creating the complicity that allows, like every time we're surprised, every time we're surprised by something that they do around this, right? We were just having this conversation of like, so now they're giving unborn rights to, the rights to unborn in the tax code, right? Like, and we're surprised. Like, why didn't we think of something? Like, like why, don't, why can't we just be assholes about it? And I think that's what this requires. And um, part of it is, you know, we're in this moment where we're fighting to keep things the way they were under previous administrations, and we forget that previous administrations, for as much as we love them, did not work for the vast majority of people. And so to me, this, there's the potential for true reinvention and reimagination, but we have to be willing to be assholes about it. So when you are queen of the assholes one day, <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to be on that team. <laughs> um, what would you like to see differently? <sighs> yeah, the limits of my imagination. Um, so first, I just think about like what would it take for us, for all of us to see this both as a justice issue for all communities um, and how to engage the 50% of the population that isn't involved. Because you know, we used to joke, what was it, you know? It, yeah, you know, when men start experiencing this level of lack of autonomy in their lives is when the notion of what autonomy is is going to shift. And if movements for racial justice and LGBT rights and you know immigrants' rights start seeing this as an issue that is about controlling communities, not just controlling women, but controlling communities and the size of communities and the resources that communities have, it's going to shift the level of engagement. So I think there's a lot of work that we need to do internally within the movement to reshape it and reframe it so it's more, so it speaks to people's lives, daily lives, not that one morning that you wake up and you're like, damn it, I need an abortion, or damn it, I need to go to the clinic and get some you know, family planning. Make sure you all take notes and reframe the reproductive health rights and justice movement for Sujatha ASAP. Yes. <laughs> um, thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, so you, um, I know that um, both in your work um, with Black Lives Matter and your history, I'm curious about what you care about today about the set of issues. I think a lot of my experiences or why I care about this issue comes from my personal experiences. Um, and I think for most of us that's probably true. Um, how is it that we come to care about anything? Um, mostly through personal experience or our, our biases towards a particular thing. When I was in school, I mostly remember people using a lot of scare tactics as sex education. Like they would say to me, um, and even my parents, and we've had, hey mom, we've had, um, being live streamed, we've had um, conversations about this before, but they would say, and it was always a, some kind of a punitive approach, mostly to female identified children. Um, and so also, you know, thinking about how sexist a lot of the um, conversations around race and reproduction are, um, folks would say, you know, 
don't end up 16 years old and pregnant, as if being a 16-year-old pregnant person was the worst thing that could happen to you. Um, and I will just say, I know a lot of young parents who are thriving and doing an amazing job of taking care of their children. Um, and so that always made me feel concerned about why the approach was to make me feel afraid um, for what might happen to me, um, and something that didn't feel so scary to me, like having a baby. Um, but I think, you know, oftentimes when we think about what people are to this country, um, oftentimes it's a way for you, to, how you can earn or contribute as an adult, and having a child makes you, what, less than that in some kind of way. So, you know, that made me feel afraid. I also, um, I care about this because I watched my sister, who was 23, you know, she became pregnant and had a baby, and the way that they treated her, um, being a young parent, young 23-year-old, um, forced her into a cesarean section, a cesarean section, and didn't give her very many options. Um, that made me come to care about this. I was also watching as a college student, as resources being taken away from college students or through our health insurance, we were losing access to birth control. Um, and kind of watching that assault on people's lives, and it wasn't always just um, women, it was sometimes men, it was sometimes trans people or DNC folks, but, um, but it was a wide array of attacks happening throughout my both my childhood from my family whose perception of my desire to be sexual or desire to reproduce meant that I was um, insatiable or I couldn't control myself and that was embarrassing because it was an assumption that was um, predicated um, before I was even born um, that black girl children are forced to defend ourselves um, because of the stereotypes about our about who we are long before we're even able to make those decisions um, of fluid mind. So what I care about today stems from a lot of those experiences. I also, um, for a third of my life, grew up in a place where a lot of people were receiving state assistance who were being um, either coerced or encouraged to not have more children. Um, so as to save the state some money, not as if they're not spending millions of dollars on prisons, but um, you know where they tried to pinch the funds were always punitive towards specifically black women, um, but brown women as well. And so um, I care about a lot today. Those things haven't changed. The things I, I cared about then, I, I still care about now. But, um, but I think right now what feels most insidious is that there's the conversation feels fatigued for people, or at least that's my perception of it, is that um, like many of the issues that require behavior change on the part of a, a significant amount of people, um, people tend to, I feel like people tend to get fatigued of these conversations and therefore we're not having them as often. And so as a, as a communication strategist, I'm always trying to find new ways to talk about it. I think this tax thing is an important conversation. Somebody should write an op-ed tomorrow in the paper about this. Um, but I think that, the, even though the issues tend to evolve, my reasons for being involved have stayed the same. I'm curious, you do a lot of work around um, sort of neuroscience and how people understand um, issues. Mm -hmm. I'm curious how you've been thinking about, particularly in the fatigue conversation, but also in the ways in which people were stigmatized, mm -hmm. um, young people mm -hmm. and black folks and you know, people on welfare, like how you've thought about bringing that part of your work um, into this conversation? That's a good question. Um, I don't pretend to be a, a scientist of any sort, but um, working in communications, one thing I've noticed, particularly around race and issues of gender, uh, is that behavior change is incredibly hard. Um, if you can't get your roommate to put the toilet seat down, how can you get somebody to change their stance on abortion? Um, so, you know, I think one of the things I'm constantly wondering is um, where do people get the ideas that they get? So on this Thing, this thread of curiosity that I'm writing about for public seminar, I'm curious about not implicit bias, we know that it exists, but how does it start? Where does it come from? Um, who's deciding what information people get and why? Who's opining on important political issues that impact millions of Americans? Um, and why are those people not reflective of, of who lives in the United States? Um, so. I'm, I'm often curious about how we frame this issue. Not just, it's not just the burden of people working in the reproductive health rights and justice movement to frame it so that men or trans folks or GNC people or whomever um, get involved in these issues. It's also the job of the media to do that. It's the job of media decision makers who 
um, and of people who write textbooks. Um, I don't know who those folks are, but they're doing a terrible job of including this. I mean, not necessarily college textbooks, I don't know, but high school textbooks are terrible. Um, I think there's a textbook in, in Fresno, California that referred to a, um, a girl, if she was not a virgin, as a dirty shoe um, a case and a case that the ACLU worked on. Uh, but this is what people are teaching folks. And so to me, it's, it's less about when we when we arrive to the point where we realize we are not participating in eliminating these structures that, that refuse to allow people the fundamental dignified decision to say, I'm choosing when and where to have a child, but it's how that information even becomes plausible in the first place. One question I had in, um, in the Peace for Public seminar was, when did it become a litmus for whether, when did how much money you make become a litmus for whether or not you can have a baby? I'm, I'm, and why are we not interrogating the labor market? Why are we not interrogating how people become poor in the first place? Is it really poor black women who are to blame? Are we not really talking about wealth hoarders here? You know, is it true that if you you know can afford to have um, all the babies that you want, then that I mean, I don't know. I don't see any petitions taking these shows like 18 and counting down, but I see people refusing to allow people to have enough money to feed their families. So there's so many inherent contradictions in there. And I think like digging into the what biases we have, one thing is we're really neoliberal in this work we're, uh, in the way that we talk about it. And it's all relative, but you know, I've worked with very smart people in the progressive left who have been fighting campaigns um, against wage theft or who've been working for um, to close the gender pay gap who also don't see anything wrong with then telling um, a low-income black or brown woman that she should abstain from having children because she doesn't have enough money. That we can't see the inherent contradictions in our own work, in our own lives, that you know those of us with enough to earn and, and do that aren't fighting for poor people to continue to be able to reproduce or to have siblings in their families. And so I think it's just, it's so deep seated, the tropes that come from this. And um, we have to do a better job of A, having courageous conversations with decision makers in the media who portray bad stereotypes and tropes that lead people to making these either implicit or explicit biased conclusions about certain people and their reproduction. We also have to think about ourselves and how we're contributing either subconsciously or consciously to those, those same stereotypes. And then we have to do our due diligence and have these conversations out loud. Yeah. I'm always struck by um, the amount of passive voice that's used um, in these, right? Like, had an abortion, not decided to get, you know, so all of those things. So I think about that often in terms of language and framing. Um, talk to me a little bit about how this is a justice issue for you. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I grew up um, in and around neighborhoods where people were, um, didn't have access to sex education. I mean, it was like you go to school and they either refused to teach it to you or it was kind of half-assed. Um, and as I think most of us know, like it's hit or miss whether or not the, the textbooks or the schools will actually cover it at all. Um, and then in those same people were de denied access to contraception um, or were forced to pay exorbitant prices for it, um, couldn't easily find it. When, when those folks became pregnant, they were denied access to abortion. Um, and then when they had a child that they didn't want and couldn't afford, they were told that they and their families were drains on the system. It's kind of what I call the vortex of shit. And it's like at every single wall you were hitting um, some kind of punitive legislation or policy predominantly made by white men who were saying that you can't have access to any of these things, but also we're not gonna make sure that you can earn at the same level as everybody else. And so, um, I mean, in that way, it felt there should be some justice. Um, so it, you know, the, reproduct the access to having an abortion or access to contraception or reproductive rights, as we call them, um, is often limited by, for many people by other factors that we don't take into consideration, um, like access to transportation. So in California, for example, more than 50% of our counties do not have abortion providers. It's important to know we are not a bastion of progressive liberalism. Um, there's San Francisco and Los Angeles where there are clinics, and then in the Central Valley um, between there and then upstate and, and lower, I mean, there are very few. Um, so I think there's a lot of assumptions about what we do and do not have, particularly um, uh, 
particularly certain communities in this country, and also there's a lot of misinformation. And the way that we talk about reproductive health rights and justice is incredibly reductive. I mean, it, as Sujatha said, it can be expanded if we think about the experiences of the people in this room. I mean, there are a number of ways that we could intersect this conversation. Um, but justice for me um, has to do mostly with eradicating anti-blackness. And, um, and to me, everything else is palliative. If we don't get rid of how if we don't, if you read the readings and, and, and you read Killing the Black Body, Dorothy Roberts talks a lot about, you know, this country was built on the reproduction of black women. And when black babies were no longer useful for this country, we created the carceral system to um, cage them, right? So, um, so forever, black women were forced to reproduce. Those babies used as a means of labor. And then when you know, when, I mean, I, I'd say that when the, the system shifted to the carceral system, we just started locking people up. So it's been a justice issue. It's gonna always be a justice issue. And I think if we don't approach it from the justice lens, we're just gonna be putting a Band-Aid on a cut jugular vein. So you're somebody who has, um, as an activist, come of age um, in an era of a framework of reproductive justice. Mm -hmm. What has that meant for your activism? Well, I mean, I'm not going to pretend I didn't know what reproductive justice was 10 years ago. Um, you know, so I'm I'm still learning, and I don't I don't think I'll ever be able to transcend what it means to be a reproductive justice organizer or activist. And um, for the person who asked about what men can do, I mean, I think it. it I think you can do everything anybody else can do, <laughs> which is to say, um, you know, not to rely necessarily on women to tell you what to do in this field, but um, to do a little due diligence and, and, and reading and research, and, and there are ways for everybody to participate in this. I think that I, you know, in the reading that I've done, um, obviously black feminism played a huge role into catapulting people working in this particular field into thinking about access beyond the right or beyond what your body looks like. Um, but like, who's at home keeping you from getting to the doctor, you know? Are you in a situation where you need more support? Is it about, you know, needing to, are you gonna have to give up the rent or the light bills to pay for this? You know, so it's thinking more broadly. And to me, I mean, it, intersectionality is, it's a lifestyle. You know, it's the way that I move through the world. And somebody told me, you know, a few years ago that I had a name, but I always knew that the people in my neighborhood couldn't get to the clinic because there was no bus route going through my neighborhood, right? And in LA, LA is walk, walk, you have to have a car mostly. And then if the bus, if the bus workers were on strike, you were screwed. You know, so there were so many things that would play into it. These conversations hardly ever came up. People talk about this um, in a way that, as if they were trying to solve some kind of medical problem. I don't know what, the, I don't know what that's called. It comes, that's a fancy word, but you know, but to me it was watching the people that I know barter. Somebody would watch somebody else's kids so they can go get an abortion. Right, or somebody would make plates for people who were coming home from the hospital or from the clinic or something like that, and that's how we did. That's how we did things. That's how many people do things. Um, so I think one thing is that you know we would have God bless Kimberly Crenshaw for giving us the language of intersectionality, and for decades and decades um, and century before that, people were were displaying intersectionality or what it looked like of justice. Um, approach look like in their everyday lives. And it is those people who are often left out of being able to opine on these conversations. I will tell you that a, a, a news station will more likely bring on a policymaker, um, a male policymaker to talk about this than they will just a person who's had an abortion. How about you just bring somebody who can say, hey, I had an abortion, I didn't have enough money, and this is what I went through to be able to get that, as opposed to somebody who will never have an abortion, who may not ever know what it's, not, what it's like to not have enough money to get a medical procedure that they need and want. Um, but so when we talk about framing of these issues, one of the biggest problems is that it's not that it hasn't always been intersectional or justice oriented, it's that the people who are talking about it are not the right people. And we have to stop inviting them onto these news shows to have these conversations. <laughs> <laughs> um, what keeps you engaged? Like, what's what's the if you were to pull one thread? What's the piece that you would pull? I feel like when people ask this question, you're always supposed to say the children. <laughs> I don't feel that way. I, mean, I feel that way, but like that's not the first thing that comes to mind for me. I always feel like such a jerk. But um, I mean, I have a 14 year old sister. Like that, it certainly does. Like Jaden, she keeps me engaged. But I think it's like it's fairness. I'm 
I'm also mad. I, I get angry every day when I think about it's, you know, we talk about equity or equality in this country and, and um, it's become, I'm fatigued now of words. I'm fatigued of equity and equality because I feel like I'm not really seeing it live out. Um, but um, w when I was in high school, our high school didn't have, was violating Title IX um, by not having enough sports for girls and I was so incensed I was like what do you mean I didn't even know what title nine was I just knew it wasn't fair I was like what do you mean we don't have as many um, and I think it's that sense of like I wake up every day and I think about you know Republican conservative <laughs> policymakers who are elected by the same people who need abortions right who are trying to insidiously write um, anti-abortion stuff into the tax code I mean, how insidious and evil is that? It's just like you sit up at night thinking of ways to ruin people's lives and you write it into the tax code. Um, but it, that's the kind of stuff that I think about. It's like, we, you know, we, it is how we live in, we, we live in what is meant to be a democracy, right? Where, you know, one person, one vote, we get, we elect, we elect our elected officials, they represent us. Um, and then we see this kind of what I've been, been experiencing it as a kind of a failed social experiment of democracy, where you know it's not it's not fair um, that a person who can afford an abortion can pay for one, um, and a person who can't has the state down their back, and then you know we see the consequences of that. Um, but but I mean I stay in, I stay engaged because what else is there? I mean for me this is it. This is all there is. You know we are going to spend a lifetime. Um, trying to make life better for a lot of people. Um, and I, I don't know what else there is um, that feels like it. Um, so you asked me the question about um, what breaks your heart and what heals your soul on this issue. What's it been for you? Mm, well, on the heartbreak side, on the heartbreak side, it's a lot of, um, I think it's a lot of privilege. Um, you know, I, I think accessing, a lot of people take accessing medical care for granted. I mean, even thinking about reproductive health technologies, like if you can't become pregnant and you want to, some people can afford to pay tens of thousands of dollars to do that. And I'm not hating at all. I'm glad that that exists. And it just to imagine that that doesn't exist across the board, um, that a person who is poor and uh, can't reproduce on their own or needs support doing that um, would need to do a Kickstarter or a fundraiser to do that. Um, so you know, so it's that it's the it's that you know we don't we have these conversations I think oftentimes siloed or in a vacuum and it's relativity right if you don't have any poor friends you're not probably talking to poor people about their reproductive issues that's another thing is that we are incredibly segregated in, in the way that we talk about or access these issues and so oftentimes people won't believe me when I say that there are there are 16 states that um, don't allow a family receiving cash assistance from the state to receive additional assistance if they have a baby people will say I don't believe that that's true that the state would punish you for for having another baby and it's true there are 16 states that do that, not California, because we worked hard to get rid of it. Um, but, um, and I don't know how that's being implemented, actually. But I mean, I think that um, part of the heartbreak is that I, I'm surrounded by well-meaning people who aren't curious at all about why people don't earn at the same level. Um, uh, those same folks I was telling you about who would fight against the wage theft and wouldn't think about why it was precarious to tell a black or brown low-income person that they should just give their baby away if they can't afford it. How is that a reasonable solution for anybody? Um, and those kind of inconsistencies and uh, that we are living with, I mean, they, they exist, they're all around us, and we should welcome the courageous and political struggle that it takes to actually have those important conversations with the people around us, but we can't be afraid of having those conversations. Um, and then I think what's healed me about this, I will never forget my first Let's Talk About Sex conference in 2011, Sister Song, an organization currently run by Monica Simpson, um, throws this amazing conference um, where we talk about sex and reproduction and love. And um, it, was, it was, there were hundreds of black women who just like swarmed Miami and we spent four days having really good conversations about things people never ask us about. 
Um, and it was incredibly healing for me. All I had ever heard was all of these stereotypes that were, were decided about me and people who looked like me before I was even here, that I would become pregnant at 16 years old. Um, and that was terrible, that boys only wanted one thing from me. I heard that all the time, right? That I was just a vessel for sex or for reproduction at some point. And finally, or, or that I was insatiable, that like my sexual desires were because of some rabid, weird genetic thing that where I couldn't control myself, you know, I just dropped my pants for everybody. And that that was it. Beyond that, there was nothing more to me or about me and nobody was asking me any questions about myself. And so this, for the first time, people asked me what I cared about around my, around my sexual life, around my reproduction. Did I wanna have children? They, people sounded excited about it. I had never up until that point had anybody sound excited about me having a child. Just sad all the time, you know? So that was healing for me and I continue to stay, you know, constantly affirmed by people in this movement. And there's a lot of shit in the movement, let me tell you. And that's another part of the heartbreak is that the kind of internal struggle we go through with with predominantly white women, with decision makers, with funders, even the anti-blackness within inside this movement is is really heartbreaking. Even getting my colleagues and peers in this movement to believe that I'm none of those things I just listed, um, having to defend myself inside of those those movements, but then being able to have conversations with you, you know, it's healing. So, um, if you were to look into the future, what do you forecast or see for this? issue or movement. So um, Ta-Nehisi Coates is on this, this whole trip where he's not giving anybody hope. <laughs> he was like, if you want hope, go to your pastor. Um, I thought that was great because I think people, you know, when we answer these questions, I would like to say that I have this prophetic vision for the future that, you know, gets to all of our internal and external struggles around reproductive health rights and justice. But the reason this issue is, is so challenging is because it does intersect with everything, with all the parts of our lives. And so, um, and so touching any part of it means that we've got to contend with most of it, right? When we talk about access or getting somewhere, we've got to talk about money. We've got to then talk about capitalism, and then we've got to solve for capitalism, and how do we do that, you know? So I think what I feel, so what I'm feeling most inspired by right now is, is I think your quest for innovation around this issue in particular, you know, four or five years ago got me re-inspired about this movement. Um, because, you know, we talk about innovation as it relates to reproductive health technologies, but like how do we innovate on solving for, an, you know, access to abortion for everybody? You know, on an issue that feels so, um, so solidified in our public discourse abortion, you know, we've been talking about it forever, it feels like, right? How do we get people a renewed sense of self around it? You know, we have to organize people at the intersection of their insecurity. And what are people insecure about? Overpopulation? You know, they're afraid that black and brown women are just gonna have so many babies, there's no more space on earth. But these like large corporations have no responsibility to, to get their carbon footprint under control. You know, our people are afraid of, of more black people that, right? Like, what are people really afraid of when we're talking about, you know, fear of encouraging people to have, on one hand, encouraging people to have more or fewer babies because of the kinds of babies they're having, and on the other hand, denying them access to abortion. It's, so, they're such weirdos with this stuff, you guys. I mean, really, if you just sit down and write, write it all down, like, the contradictions are just in there throughout. So, Anyway, sorry, you were asking me what I... Just what do you yeah, forecast for the I future? Forecast? I mean, I think... Well, let me ask you this question, which is, if you were to give the no hope answer, what would it be? I think, I think the low hope answer, I'm not going to go as far as Tani Hasi goes. I think that I appreciate what he has to say, but um, I'm a black queer woman in the world. I have to keep some hope. Um, I would say, like, the low hope answer is that, like, we, is that we are going to fail a lot in our lives. We're going to fail. People are going to be denied access. They're going to have children they can't afford and don't want. Those children are going to be, um, they, well, lots of things happen to those children. But anyway, they won't be perhaps, at, they won't be able to thrive as much as they would have had they been born to a family who would desire to have a child, um, is that we just have to contend with bad things are going to happen. I think um, when we overinflate our 
of what's possible, I think sometimes it leads to be us being incredibly disappointed when failure happens. And failure happens a lot. And as Sujatha taught me, we have to fail fast to learn fast. And so my low hope is that, um, is that we're going to fail a lot and we're going to be really sad and overwhelmed by it. Um, and then, but I will forecast that we will be iterative in the way that we approach this, this issue and other issues. Um, and in that way, I think that there's lots of hope. Um, so I realized um, in the title of this talk, we it's you know, race and reproduction from genocide and slavery to designer babies, and we haven't had that conversation. Um, so maybe I'll just say a couple of things yeah. about that, and then we can open up. Um, so one of the pieces of work that I did uh, several years ago was when I started understanding the development of new technologies and reproductive technologies and genetic technologies was, um, and I wasn't the only person, there was a conversation happening around it, which is like, if we continue with a framework of choice and this idea, if we continue to fight for this idea that women have the right to decide whether or not to be pregnant and we use that choice framework, as these technologies become online, so prenatal screening and testing and the ability to edit genes, does that framework then allow us to argue that women also have the right to choose the genetic characteristics of their children, right? Does autonomy extend to the genetic characteristics of children? And if that is the case, then where do we as progressives land on this issue of what is essentially the new eugenics, right? And more even than just this idea that, because you know, once people can choose the genetic characteristics of their future children, you know they're not gonna be sh choosing short, dark folks with dark eyes, right? Like all of the biases that we have, all of you know, the ways in which oppression operates, um, will come into play into informing those decisions. But even more importantly to me, um, and this is my no hope answer, is if we don't figure this out, what we're looking at is a future where we're actually genetically encoding inequality. Now think about that. Like right now we talk about race as a social construction. But what would it mean when we are actually talking about a genetically encoded inequality? And so, this issue, it is, in a sense, as long as human beings have been organized in groups and families and competing for resources, um, this issue around reproduction and who controls it and who decides and who has access and what are they selecting for is gonna be what shapes society. And so, um, as we think about what the future of this issue is, and if we don't really get our act together, not only to get beyond this question of choice versus access, but to truly, genuinely have a deep conversation about inequality and reproduction. We are gonna not only, you know, we talk about Margaret Sanger and Planned Parenthood and how that was part of eugenics movement, but the true eugenics movement, I think, is ahead of us unless we figure out how to do something differently around this issue. So that's my nightmare. Um, <laughs> any last question that you have for me or that I might have for you as we wrap up our, <coughs> and open it up to? Well, one thing that might be useful for folks here in this room is um, how can we bring this conversation um, and here to the new school? Um, what are your plans around bringing future conversations around race and reproduction here and how can students at the new school get involved? So I, mean, I think what I what so attracted me to the new school is one the core commitment to social justice, right? So you know this is a space where we actually don't have to make a case for social justice. It is part of what is the norm. Um, but more importantly, it's really this idea of innovation and how are we thinking both about the future, what does the future look like and how are we working backwards to then what do we need to do now? And in particular innovation, I'm excited about, you know, where, what, as, as I think about social movements, social movements have public policy, there's a sort of, a, a sort of structural component to it, there's an arts and cultural component to it, there's a media component to it, there's a knowledge component to it. And, you know, I think, hmm, well, let's see, the 
New School has uh, Milano Public Policy, and it's got Parsons Design, and it's got the you know COPA for Arts and Culture, and it's got Media Studies, and you know so it's got all of these components where these are all the pieces of what's needed for successful social movements. And so, how do we leverage all of those things, not just on this issue? Because um, you know, as Chanel talked about, as you talked about, like the intersectionality of this to me is not about siloing it, but how do we integrate it into every issue, right? So part of Black Lives Matter, part of immigration reform, part of, part of sustainability. And this conversation is in, an integral part of all of those. It's not separate. Somehow we've convinced ourselves of that. And so um, I'm interested in using this space for us to reimagine and innovate um, at a movement level and not just a, like, not just an analysis level, but actually like, what are we trying? What are we prototyping? What are we testing? What are we experimenting? What are we failing at? Uh, well, speaking of experiments, one more question is, you were talking about getting, reframing it so that more people felt like they could see themselves reflected in this movement. Um, I have lots of ideas and feelings about that. I'm curious, how do we make people, I mean, it feels weird to ask how do we make people care? I don't want to assume judgment that people don't care, but how do we get people more involved? So I think one of the biggest challenges is that this is a movement that's supremely dependent on philanthropic dollars. And um, you know, if you start looking into many foundations, um, one, they were set up at a time of both concern around the environment and the population explosion. So in the DNA of most philanthropic giving is actually a population control agenda. And I think about this often, which is like, so on one hand, you have you know, conservative advocates really pushing for the birth of more white babies, right? You restrict access to abortion, you restrict access to contraception, you get more white babies. And on the other side, you have progressive folks who are talking about, well, let's push access to abortion and contraception, mostly for poor black and brown women. Right, so you have actually eugenics on both sides, which is like more white babies, fewer black and brown babies. And that's the DNA of the philanthropic giving around this. And so one of the first things we have to do is liberate ourselves from that or, you know, yeah. Like how do we keep pushing the boundaries of what they will fund um, in terms of more interesting and expansive ideas? So I think that's one place to start. And then the second is, you know, Nah. This is love. So if I were king for a day, forget the queen. If I were a king for the day, um, really just like what is the series of conversations that we want to have about love, sex, and family? Like how do we start that? Like if every day everybody had just asked each other questions like what are your hopes and dreams today about love, sex, and family, and what do you want? And how do you then you tie it to sustainability? And how do you tie it to immigration? And how do you tie it to Black Lives Matter? Like those are the kinds of conversations that I, th I think can start shifting. But um, the philanthropically funded work is incredibly constraining and it keeps us in this box of reproductive rights is about abortion and contraception. And it's not. One other thing, um, 10 years ago, I was here writing I was here writing the Cheers and Jeers column at Women's E! News, um, and Women's E! News had gotten, at that time, one of the first grants to study maternal mortality and morbidity among black women. So um, in thinking about access and choice and decisions and punitive legislation, um, even when people of color have children, can't are able to carry a pregnancy to term um, that they want, they're more likely to die after giving birth and those babies are more likely to die. Black women are four times more likely to die um, after giving birth than their white counterparts. And so um, we're seeing a lot of this, a lot of even stress around racism and socioeconomic status impact pregnant people um, such that they cannot carry and deliver a baby that will live. Um, so even thinking, I mean, for me, part of this also hinges on more eradicating anti-blackness, but like significantly reducing racism in this country so that people can um, l carry a pregnancy to term if they choose and that that baby and that that parent will live. Um, 
Yeah. Um, I have one question for you. Um, so on my Facebook page the other day, it reminded me that uh, the Occupy movement was six years ago. Um, and, um, and I also just think about the tremendous impact that Black Lives Matter has had just on our notions of movement building. I'm curious what lessons would you take from the work that you've done in Black Lives Matter um, to bring to the reproductive health rights work? particularly around movement building. Yes, um, I would center organizing. <laughs> I mean, I think in the reproductive health rights and justice movement, we've gotten really far away from organizing, <laughs> and I, I, don't, I won't pretend to know when and where that happened or if it was ever surrounded, or organizing was ever at the center. But if we're not talking about, um, if we're not talking about going out into communities, door knocking, having one-on-one -on -one conversations with people, um, seeing people face to face that that look different than you have different politics, different socioeconomic statuses. If we're not encouraging courageous conversations, struggling politically with people to get to like where our differences are and how we move um, with them or through them or past them. Um, I think that one thing I admire most about the movement for Black Lives is that at the center of that. Um, is organizing. It means building people power so that we can talk about how we want to govern ourselves, not relying on elected officials who have proven time and again that, that they don't necessarily have our best interests at hearts, but saying, this isn't working for us, and so we're going to develop a new system. We're going to give you, you know, we're going to recommend policy changes, or we're going to build new governing structures. And it's so um, inspiring to imagine a future that we've never seen before with, with the eradication of systems that have hurt most people most people have been hurt by the systems that exist in this country, um, save a select few. But the, the centering around building power, particularly for black people, so not being able to say that we are unapologetically black or that we are building black power, those things are incredibly important um, so as to destigmatize also how people understand organizing. And I think that you know we could we could pass all the legislation we want. It'll it can, it has the, the ability to be overturned in the next election cycle. Um, if we're not, if we're not, you know, people talk about changing hearts and minds. What that is to me is, is having those courageous conversations with people, it's organizing. Um, so, you know, when you need a base of, of people to come out and support um, your activities around whatever issue you're working on and you don't have folks to call, that's a problem. You know, we should be able to turn folks out to say that we have an established base of people who will show up and stand beside us. And we can we can litigate in the courts and we can pass legislation, but at the center of all of this is um, really about moving people and in their hearts and in their heads. Great, thank you. Um, so with that, we're gonna open it up for questions. So um, who's the mic person to run around? I guess the benefit of being in the first row, I get to ask the first question. So I, I have comments that I'm looking for your reaction to, and they center around data and these issues. So the, the first one is uh, early, around the turn of this, this century, um, there was a lot of research looking at the link between abortion and crime. The argument was that Abortion led to reductions in crime. Now, I'm, I'm concerned about these narratives, it, and you know, it became popular. And, and the studies have later been refuted, but there was a causal assertion that allowing for abortions led women who were more likely to produce a child that would be mischief and, and likely to, to... And then there was even arguments around abortion being a protective factor against black-white infant mortality, um, which is oxymoronic, if you... Right? Uh, it, but... You know, the second genre is recently, about a week ago, Planned Parenthood had a tweet where they argued that it was statistically safer for a black woman to have an abortion, I'm sorry, to yeah, to have an abortion than to carry a child through to term. This is, again, a misuse of statistics because that's true for white women as well. And then the question becomes, what's the point? Um, but the last thing is related to the issue that you brought up around uh, eugenics and genetic encoding. And that is, as we move into this, I guess, data revolution in general, the use of data around genetic material, big data collecting large, large sums of information and, and drawing causal explanations, 
a lot of it is based on correlation. It's not as if we theoretically understand the mechanisms or can define the linkages, um, but it's going to become deterministic in its argument that, you know, if we find a correlation between a group of people and some outcome that's not well stood, understood, we will draw conclusions based on race, but ignore other potential explanatory factors because we culturally are predispositioned to believe that there's some innate differences between the groups. So I guess if you can comment and elaborate on how data is used in, in these battles to, I guess, uh, <laughs> distort views and, and lead to more pejorative narratives. Yeah. Well, so I think this is actually a, a question that Chanel and I can answer from different perspectives, but b both this piece that, um, so we, our brains don't do well with dissonance, right? So once we already have a framework, we then try and apply it to everything. And so, and I think this is very much what happens in science and particularly around genetics. Um, so one is the dominant framework in scientific debates but, and tends to be one that science is one always good um, and two, that we measure its success based on individual outcomes. So it never is a question of like, and then what is the collective impact, right? So for example, around prenatal screening, many of these tests and technologies were developed around disability. And so the justification as well, you know, disability is quote, so horrible that it's completely justified to be able to deselect based on that, but then the extension then becomes, once we can start proactively selecting or editing, we don't have the intellectual frameworks to draw lines on like prevention versus proaction, and also we don't have the intellectual frameworks to talk about collective impact, right? So even around genetic technologies, I would say the goal isn't to regulate any individual woman's decision about what she does, what genetic makeup she chooses, but our job is to change the context in which she's making the decision. So our job is to eliminate disability oppression and then let a woman decide whatever she wants about whether or not to carry a fetus that has a diagnosis of a possible disability. The same thing, if we eliminate racism, then people are gonna be less interested in selecting for skin color in these. So um, I would say like the biggest challenge, and this is where, and I'll pass the mic to you, Chanel, which is it is really the frameworks within which we have these discussions. So data, like you said, can be used to absolutely justify, and that's the start of the eugenics movement, right? It was measuring skull sizes. So. The idea was there, then they just started measuring skull sizes to justify the treatment, so. And, um, I mean, one thing, so this idea that, you know, it, it significantly reduces crime, if you give black women abortion, it reduces crime. I mean, that that is reifying the assumption that black people are predisposed to committing more crime, which has been proven to be untrue. It, crime is about proximity, how c close you are to people. So we don't talk about, quote unquote, white on white crime because it's not a narrative that is useful that people in this country who are decision makers or people with power find useful. Um, and so often, so the framework is exactly right. But also, I mean, the question I always ask is like, who who's doing this data? Like, who's the person who is, Okay, what, I love that Derek actually knows the answer to the question that I had. I was asking rhetorically, for example, <laughs> um, is what are the people's motives for creating this data? And also, who are the people asking the questions? One of the biggest issues I've had um, among the social sciences are who are the social scientists who are developing the questions and where do their biases lie? And can can we ask that question honestly without, um, without you know, we're not attacking people's credibility as a scientist necessarily, but but perhaps as a human, right? That we are all prone to having biases and, the, and, and it can be garbage in and garbage out sometimes, but also because people pay to get studies done to reify the assumptions that they already have to confirm the biases they they already believe, um, and oftentimes to prove a point um, that ends up being punitive or hurtful to some other community. And so um, to me, a lot of this 
often again comes and stems from anti-blackness or uh, or the idea that some people are deserve to be rejected and some people are superior um, and in that way I think data can be really um, hurtful to a lot of oppressed communities I'll just add, I mean, I've been in rooms in institutions like the University of California, Berkeley, which is sort of a bastion of liberalism, where I've had, I've, list, I've heard faculty debate whether they can, is, are, can we reclaim the best aspects of eugenics and, re, you know, reject the worst, right? Like, so somehow that there's still some goodness. And that, even just being able to ask that question is dependent on a homogenous worldview. So as soon as you have more diverse voices and perspectives that are able to challenge those assumptions and that experience is when you're gonna start seeing some shift data and how it's interpreted. Um, so we, I feel like we talk about this a little bit every week, but um, so we are you know, sitting at the new school in these very plush leather chairs. Um, having this conversation, um, I look forward to having the conversation next term with you, Sajatha, around this specifically and like reimagining what it can look like, but where or how and what are the tools that we can use to have this conversation like outside of this space, right? Like I need to talk to this, I need to talk to my like nine-year-olds about reproductive justice. I need to talk to 16-year-olds about it. I need to talk to 65-year-olds about it. Like I need those conversations to be happening in places that are not here where it costs a lot of money for me to like be in this space and what are ways that we can start to to encourage those conversations right people get real i was a sex educator for a long time and i have had many a battle a crying parent a, an angry parent when i say the word sex to their child right or say the word sex to them um and those parents are sometimes the administrators right and and get to decide where those conversations happen and how they happen so how and, and what are ways that we can open up having conversations around love, sex, and family with everybody all the time? Well, I wouldn't, you know, I don't think having conversations in these spaces is anything to sneeze at. I've been in these spaces with plenty of people who need to have lots of conversations, stuff like this. Um, you know, I, because fo folks at the new school vote <laughs> and they vote on ballot initiatives or for people who do or don't support access to reproductive health rights and justice for people who will never be in this room, you know? Um, so the conversations wherever they're happening, I think are incredibly important. Um, I want to lift up the National Network of Abortion Funds. Um, I think that as an organization, they're an organization um, of more than 80 funds who help provide access to abortion specifically, um, though I understand we're, we're broadening the conversation, um, in most states where uh, state government, a government agencies, are, the state won't pay for it. Um, and they're having courageous conversations online um, and in person through practical support with people who need access to these kinds of services. Um, there's a whole ecosystem of reproductive health rights and justice organizations organizations, um, including Coraline organization that Sujatha founded, um, that that's encouraging people to have these conversations. I mean, it's not, you know, it's not, I don't think it's a, um, it's, a, it's, it's intentional to me that we're not having these conversations in public, right? That there's so much shame and stigma around being able to talk about this or bringing this up to people around why it's shameful for you to talk to your family about it or why saying sex to somebody, uh, to somebody's child may be perceived as um, inappropriate um, when sex and family and love are cornerstones of most people's lives in, the, in this country and everywhere. Um, but I think one like eradicating the stigma around that, I mean, I don't actually know um, how we do that <laughs> per se, but that's a conversation that we should be having. Why is it so stigmatizing to talk about sex, to talk about periods, to talk about um, families of different shapes and sizes? Um, so where does that come from and how do we eliminate that? And then for those of us um, who are feel, who feel confident about it, you know, where, how can we innovate on where to have these conversations and how? And in, in the idea of reframing, I mean, I think, you know, sex, love, and family um, by themselves are issues that mo most people could find themselves interested in, 
But again, how do we organize people around the intersection of what they care about and those things, right? Um, people have so many problems that they don't need one more thing. And you know, then that's what we're often bringing people when we're talking about these issues. We're like, this terrible thing happened today. Can you? Can we talk about it? I mean, who wants to say yes to that? You know, nobody. But if we could, I think if we could find ourselves being more generous with these conversations in a way that encourages people. Um, to be more open and talk about it in a way that brings their own personal experiences into the room that we'd have a bit more luck. But oftentimes how we approach it is um, is like, you know, we, we lost this piece of legislation or this terrible thing happened. And I don't think anybody's anybody's has a desire to talk about more bad things, particularly under this, legis this administration. I'll just add, um, I think one of the biggest challenges that we face in the United States is that we actually don't have many autonomous social movements. And by autonomous, autonomous, I mean that are not funded by the government and not funded by philanthropy, right? So, and in fact, I mean, to me, what is so intriguing and exciting about both Occupy and Black Lives Matter is that these are really some of the two of those autonomous movements that the agenda is not getting set by other people other than the folks that are in the movement. And it has its challenges, right? Like we saw what happened with Occupy. But um, so part of the struggle is creating those autonomous spaces where larger institutions don't have an agenda. And one of the ways that that happens is that many people who do movement work expect to be paid for movement work, right? So I've had conversations with staff who you know, make good money. And when we have an evening meeting, they're like, are you gonna pay for childcare too? And it's like, Yes, and like, where's the space for us to be activists outside of our paid time? Um, and that, and I think, you know, like you said, like to bring one more thing to people, but that is part of, it is only when we're gonna be in those autonomous spaces. And I actually think educational institutions, they are set up for us to be able to have some of those kinds of conversations about how might we create those autonomous spaces. In some ways, they're protected spaces for us to imagine, test, experiment, and recreate in ways that we can then take outside the room. But it's hard to find the spaces for us to imagine together. Should we do, is this, are we done with the questions? Is there more, another question? All right. Um, when I saw the top title, I was hoping that there was a topic that could be expanded on maybe just a little bit. Um, specifically, we had talked about the difference between black and white communities, but I was interested in hearing um, what you think of the eugenics movement in the context of colorism within the black and brown communities. Um, and if you could talk about that just a little bit or what your opinions are, or your fears and hopelessness are. Oh. Yeah, I mean, I actually think you probably know the answer, which is um, we live in systems where colorism happens. I mean, I, you know, as an Indian woman, I grew up with a mom who talked about she ate almonds when she was pregnant with me with for the hopes that I would be born lighter skinned, right? So it's not like our communities and our people don't have not imbibed um, those prejudices and biases. And, you know, one of the biggest challenges around these genetic technologies is it has the potential to create a new definition of a good mother or a good parent. And a good mother will choose lighter skin, taller, smarter, whatever, you know, if we, if genes actually have anything to do with that. But like, and a bad mother will not genetically modify her child, right? And so if you're going to be a good mother just in the way that you start saving for your child's education fund and you struggle to get them into the right kindergarten, you're also gonna do this stuff. Um, so even if, and this is where the difference between individual decisions and the context in which people are making the decision really matters. Because individually, I might say, yeah, I don't like the way, and, and I've seen this with many of our friends. We, Chanel and I lived in, live, live in Oakland together where super progressive friends, once they start thinking about having children, they start moving out to the suburbs because the schools are better, right? And like to give their child a better chance, they'll do that. And so, yeah. yeah. Uh, and one, I mean, I think 
Yeah, yes, there's internalized racism and anti-blackness permeates every culture and every society. I mean, even I was in the barber shop and um, there were folks talking about um, whether or not p people in Puerto Rico thought that they would be received re reprieve from Trump because they were Puerto Rican. Um, and that, and then there, and you know, this whole conversation ensued about who's closer to whiteness, right? Who, and, and we internalize that. And certainly lots of my friends of, of many cultures are having these conversations. One thing I will say is we're doing a damn good job of clapping back on that because I'm seeing just like folks out here in the world celebrating blackness in so many, I mean, one, I think thing about the movement that we maybe didn't anticipate was how much people would be celebrating black culture as a form of resistance. And that is, and that to me as a tactic is a way for us all to see a, the relevance of black people, but um, also how we can use cultural relevancy in that kind of way to push back against what could feel like constant attacks on our, on what we look like on our, on our race. But, um, but you know, seeing dandyism and seeing this unapologetically black frame, and and watching you know black queer people surface and fly and soar and, and be magical um, in the world is one way that we're beating back against this kind of intercultural anti-blackness that happens. Um, and I think if we continue to do more of that, um, we'll see some significant change around that. Hi, um, thank you. Um, I was wondering, after doing the reading for tonight and stuff, that the history of reproductive justice in the United States is such so tied to the aspect of eugenics, um, and how that, like the the movement has been, you know, a choice for some and control for others. Um, and I I know it's not just like cis women, especially with like the Tuskegee experiment and sterilization to that side sterilization of trans people um and i was just wondering because you mentioned like the good part or good aspects of eugenics like, can we have a reproductive justice movement without any eugenics being applied to it in any way because even um, liberal or conservative there's still an aspect of having control over different people's bodies um, specifically people of color and trans individuals of like who can have access to what and for what reason. So I was wondering if you could speak a bit about that. Thank you. Yeah, so, um, and I think this is what gets challenging about um, the conversation around reproductive genetics in particular um, and these new technologies, because on one hand, um, they have allowed people who either were infertile or um, same-sex couples and families to form in ways that they couldn't before. And so it has actually broadened the possibility of the kinds of families that we can create. Um, and for, for people for whom the genetic tie, the genetic connection is so important, it has offered more opportunities. And so the goal isn't to shut it down um, or to deny people access. The goal is really to shift the context in which decisions are getting made. And so if we think about um, a more expansive movement around love um, and family formation, then there's so many more possibilities um, rather than less possibilities. And, and I think that's the vision that I have for the work is like how do, you know, people are gonna love in myriad ways, right? Not in these normative white picket fence ways, but in myriad ways. And so how do we make sure, how do we make, how do we fight for that? How do we fight for, you know, sex being pleasurable and in all of the sort of myriad of ways in which people enjoy sex. So it is, it is more about how do we fight against narrow definitions and control, right? Like of the right and wrong and the good and the bad and the stigma um, and the promotion. And how do we, um, as a society, shift the way people understand the decisions that they're making? I would add one thing to that, which is, um, I think folks on the progressive left, and that that's a spectrum in and of itself, how we we have the burden of introducing new information to people or not relying on like false ideology or um, other other kind of religious text even um, that the I feel like the conservatives can do or do or lies. For example, they rely on lying. Um, but um, we're, we're, we're introducing new information to people. And so in that way, we're like, while also making sure that we're um, we're giving people enough 
doses of information so that they understand it. And so I I feel like one of the places that I've been struggling with this is, um, you know, if we live in a society that recognizes gender in a particular kind of way, sex in a particular kind of way, how do we both introduce that new information while also change legislation that reflects what everybody needs, right? And when we don't, we're in a lot of ways leaving people behind. Um, and how do we have that conversation among people that we care about and people that we love? And so, um, you know, I think we've got to be really creative about how we approach this. Um, one way is thinking about when we adopt legislation, making it more inclusive. So why was same-sex marriage not um, a piece of legislation that allowed for people in families to be able to add folks to their medical insurance, right? As opposed to just saying, we have to be married. Like, why was, you know, there were ways to expand that that would have been really inclusive, but this was a fight for a particular thing. And I'm not here to say that that wasn't the right fight. I'm here to say that that fight wasn't very inclusive. Um, and so there, there are ways for us to do this better. Um, and that the more people we involve in these conversations, um, the pe people with varying levels of experience and experiences, um, I think the broader we'll get, the wider we'll get, the more inclusive we'll be, and then we won't have to backtrack. Um, you know, we're still beating back safe, legal, and rare from the 90s. Hillary Clinton used safe, legal, and rare to talk about abortion, and it's not rare. Um, one in three people have an abortion. And so thinking about, um, you know, if we say in 20 years from now, we'd like to have the most inclusive legislation that included the most people on a particular thing, how would we approach that? versus this narrow idea of, for example, same-sex marriage when we could have adopted something much more wide. So I think with that, um, we're going to, oh, is there one last question? Oh, no, there are two questions. All right, two more questions. <laughs> okay, the, yeah, let's do both questions and then we'll answer it and wrap it up. My, my question is a little bit uh, short, but broad. So one of the things I think is interesting when we talk about reproductive justice, in particular thinking about communities and who bears the burden, um, and when these increased technologies either controlling hormones or controlling our reproductive capacity, um, there isn't a whole lot of discussion about environment and climate. And one of the things that I think is really interesting is to think about how with birth control and the various kinds of pharmaceutical ways of controlling reproduction, we're just putting more and more estrogen runoff into the environment and it's certain communities that are being exposed to those high estrogen levels and not others so it goes back to this issue of why you know the wages where you live the environmental justice as well um, and so I, I guess I'd like to play devil's advocate and say as much as I am a scientist who studies reproductive technologies I do think there is some place where the line needs to be drawn um, that I think there are larger consequences proximate and ultimate of thinking about the impact that complete choice can have on entire communities. And so I just wanted to put that out there that we don't always think about the way downstream effects um, in the same ways of the flip, which is when we talk about the mortality of the uh, African-American women giving birth, um, to me that's about microaggressions, increased cortisol, and premature, premature term, right? So it, it, the race thing is the big broad thing on the front end, and then I think there's another race thing on the other end, which is like the Puerto Ricans living in an estrogen-soaked pharmaceutical environment. So I just wanted to put that out there as another way to think about how far do we want to go with choice. I'm going to try to pose what I was going to say in a way that makes it really easy to put these two things together. Um, but uh, you opened up a question that I've been thinking as you guys have been talking about. Um, who, who talks about love, sex, and family? Do I have that triad right? Yeah. And I was thinking that growing up as a queer person in the middle of the AIDS crisis, that's all we talked about all the time, right? So I came out when I was 14 into a world into which, you know, people were dying. And I think we're in a, we're always in a world in which people are dying, right? Who gets recognized and which, which of those deaths get recognized, I think is, is, pertains to what you all are talking about tonight. But I'm really, I, so I've been thinking as you've been talking, um, that perhaps it's overly simplistic, but I feel like a group of uh, white, mostly wealthy um, LGBT folks chose to stop talking about sex and start talking about marriage. Um, and I think that there's a form of loss that's so profound in that. And I think that part of that loss has to do with choosing this American way of individualizing something and making it um, about a certain small, narrow recognition of rights. And I think sometimes, about the millions of dollars that those white men and women mostly um, 
spent on those campaigns. And I think all the time, what would that have been like if it had been spent on, for instance, reproductive justice, or for instance, environmental justice, or for instance, just plain old healthcare, right? And so I think to the, to the point that you all are making, I don't exactly know how to tie this together, but here's where I think it actually ties together, which I think you all have done an incredible job of pointing out the deep complexity of severing our individual experiences from um, the capacity to live and thrive beyond our individual experiences and the way in which this particular American political climate keeps turning us inwards. Um, and so I'm interested in how you all would think about um, framing things that are complex, right? Like how do, I, how do I as a queer person speak against same-sex marriage, right, to my straight parents who think it's great <laughs> um, uh, and to other queer folks um, in a way that is not dissimilar from being able to say, um, you know, that we don't actually have time for these super individualized fights, right? Like we don't have time for that, but there's a way through it that I think you guys started us out with, which was precisely about being able to see this larger thing through this individual scale. Anyway, I've stopped making sense, so I'm gonna stop talking, but I'm wondering if you all could speak to that maybe in some way tied to what Katayuna is saying. You want to say? Um, hmm. So I think I'm going to try and answer them actually as two separate questions. Um, so part of the what I see as the gender bias, uh, both in science and the environmental movement, um, tends leads people to the conclusion that it is the number of children and it is the women choosing who are the problem, right? And so if we were to take that bias out, what we do know is that when women and families have the resources and the rights and the respect that they need to make decisions about their own love, sex, family, and community, they tend to choose smaller families. So it is actually part of the way the oppressive system works that leads to more rather than less. And I don't think the environmental problem is can, should, and ever should be solved on the backs of women and women's autonomy. But that is the dominant framework, which is like there are many problems, poverty, violence, you know, all of these things that somehow if we just control women's decision making, it's gonna solve the problem. So I think there's that bias built in that um, positions these things as paradoxical or contrary um, as opposed to expanding the way we think about it. Um, and then just to this question of, um, so when I first um, started this work of kind of reimagining the reproductive health rights justice movement, um, did a um, 13 city tour talking to a bunch of different people about like what is it that they care about around these issues. And I remember in particular talking to a group of young folks talking about reproductive rights and they were like, well, but what about sex? And I was like, oh right, sex and reproduction, they go together, they actually do not, like they're not separated. But we somehow have these movements like where the movement where we talk about sex or not so much anymore is the LGBT movement and then the movement that we talk about reproduction is the reproductive rights movement. Or, you know, and then like when I start thinking about like, well if we reframed immigration as a love and family issue, not as a labor issue, but a love and family, like people wanting to be together, um, people moving around, that would also change the framework. And so I think there's tremendous transformative potential in a reframing of all of this in a way that integrates them as opposed to the siloing. So I, I think I'm just agreeing with everything you said. I don't have much to add um, to the first question. I think it's I think I need to dig into that a little bit more. I, I hear your concerns, and I'm also concerned about your concerns, um, just to be transparent. Um, but I think this question of like how do we frame things, I, I actually would not argue that if you, I, if your parents are you know if your parents are taking the same sex marriage frame and that's working for you, for you and your parents, use that, right? And I would say the same for other folks that we 
that we talk to people in a way that they can understand it, that we don't force upon them, um, like beating people over the head with new ideas is not the way to, to get encourage people to change their behavior, shaming them or guilting them for not feeling a certain way about something certainly isn't gonna move them to be more democratic. But um, just that we, we would, as we're thinking about the development of new ideas that we would be as inclusive as possible, such that when you had then the, con the the tools to talk to your parents and you're ready. And for most people, those conversations are incredibly political. They're hard already, so entering that can be challenging. But um, but that we we use what works for us while also not well it's a do no harm approach while also not hurting other people, while also not being so reductive that we leave people out and that then we're fighting an uphill framing battle in 20 years. Um, and, and I think for most, for most of us, that's all we can ask is that we, we make a conscious effort every day to do no harm, to be as intentional as possible, um, and also to, to tap in other people when it's time. Uh, you can speak from your perspective as somebody who is queer, who came up during HIV and AIDS movement, and that's one perspective. And um, and as much as we can stop being monolithic, I think we widen things f for most people. We create better opportunities for ourselves to keep that flow of information open in the future. So with that, I think we're going to wrap it up. Michelle, do you uh, wrap it up, or should we? <laughs> I just want to thank our guest lecturers tonight, Chanel and Sujatha. And yes, let's do a round of applause. Thank you very much. And next week, please join us for an environmental justice and race discussion. Good night, everyone. Is that you, Yeah, that's me. That's me. That would be me. Yeah.